Wow. Welcome to episode 53 of the Carmudgeon Show, a part of the Haggerty Broadcasting Podcast oh, Network. Damn it. I'll never get this right. I feel like the original me starting to sing, you know, was the easy me thing. And now that we're at Haggerty, it's going to be me not being able to remember Haggerty, Haggerty Podcast, Podcast Network. Network. Or Derek clapping. Or Derek oh, clapping. Oh, yeah. Do we need a clap? Do you need a clap? Always a clap. Fuck. And we're back. Uh, this episode of the Carmudgeon Show is sponsored by Pennzoil. Where you could get a lot of motor oil. Mm. Hey, Pennzoil, I have seven cars that are overdue for oil changes. How did you get to seven overdue? I also have four cars that are overdue for timing belts. Wow. And all Talk of about being a good parent. Ten cars that are all overdue to being driven. You know what? I don't know what is or isn't overdue, and that's my solution. That's not a very helpful solution when the timing belt snaps and you bend lots of valves. I don't. Oh, yes, I do. Mm. <laughs> I don't have any cars with timing belts except for the cars that I have with timing belts. Which are Miata and... GTI? No. Chain. No? Chain oh, how GTI. luxurious. Yeah, look. Wow. Um, I've opened the engine on that car before. On your GTI? Mm -hmm. As in, like, opened it up? Like, floored it? Oh, no, like, opened the, the hood. Oh, engine compartment. Yes. Slightly different. Um, yes, I put oil in it when I change the oil. Oh, my God, so fancy. I know. What a lucky car. Uh, other than that, I don't think I've ever opened the hood on it's that It's a modern car. car. It'll tell you when it, you know, it's got a little check engine, service engine soon, when it, which means open the hood and apply money. Yeah, for real. Uh, I actually don't wait for the car to tell me. I change it every 5,000. Because in the course of our conversation with... The engineer from Pennzoil, actually, he was like, yeah, you should probably change your oil more frequently. I was like, that's not a myth. Anyway, that was informative to me. Especially the way you drive. Like a saint? A saint on a tear? <laughs> saint saint <on> Lucifer. <laughs> <laughs> Is he a saint? Was he ever knighted or sainted or whatever that happened? Anyway, um, so I feel like this episode should be about the Nissan Z because... Had I timed this properly or been thinking, or had you not been gallivanting around the world driving the world's most amazing cars, um, this episode should have launched on Monday, which was Z Day. Basically, it was the embargo date for the new 2023 Nissan Z. So I feel like we need to dedicate this episode to discussions about Nissan Zs. Well, you'll have to take lead since I've not driven it yet. But you've owned Zs and you like Zs and you've done Z thingies. Yeah, I've owned, I guess, Z owned the, the an early well it wasn't an early z because then you get into all the nerdiness about early z's and people are like no no no! if it's got the the spent air from the cabin extractor on the rear hatch then it's like a really early car and then if it's on the c pillar around the little z logo then it's a not so early car so you're talking about 240 so these are 240Zs, all 240 like all original s30 chassis cars correct um fun car i mean i finally drove a stock 240z Mm -hmm. uh, during the filming of the Icons episode on the Z, which will be out. By the time this episode is out. No, right? Icons no. Will be, is, is going to be about four weeks behind. Oh. Um, so what we did was Nissan, I, their PR team was amazing. They tried really hard to get me a car early. And the reason I asked for a car early is because I like special treatment. But also Icons is a mother to do. It's a huge production. That, that There's show. like 73 moving pieces. Ooh, and that's just the that. cars. I think we had 14 picture cars for this shoot 13 picture cars and then three more vehicles. cars than they had z's it was unbelievable and we didn't it's not like i did the obvious thing and got every generation of z um yeah, you i only had two i had the first and the current and that's it and then i had a whole bunch of other cars that you'll see um that i sort of wove into this story but i'm not going to reveal any of that for two reasons number one i want you guys to watch the icons when it comes out Number two, Paolo's sitting over there writing with a pad every time we mention something, and then we have to come up with an insert for this. And if I don't mention anything or say I can't say it, then you can't come after me asking for an insert of, oh, I need a photo of that. I really hate doing inserts. Is that, no, I hate Paolo. Uh, Here's the thing is I can say anything I want about him right now. He, he's not going to get up and get on camera and beat the shit out of me. I could see it happening. He's Italian. His name is Paolo. Um, Bobbity well, boo -bitty. <laughs> Sorry. Wow. Um, I'm Italian. I can say that. I, uh, we've already seen the Drag Race episode, so we know a little bit of what else is out there. Yeah, so that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, inside, uh, inside the story here, the show is called Camisa's Ultimate Drag Race Replay, and we have, we have an, 
the initials for every show internally. Uh, it's a, <laughs> at <laughs> you know where this is going. I do. <laughs> so internally at Haggerty, which I probably shouldn't tell you, uh, that show is called Cooter. C U D R R, and Cooter was a character on Duke's Path. Didn't I say this before? Didn't I admit this once? Shit, I should learn to keep my mouth shut. And anyway, Cooter episode three is uh, New Nissan Z versus Supra, which is its obvious direct competitor, versus Mustang Ten Speed, and that third position with the V8. With the V8. Um, so I wanted the the original the the first drag race of that to be the one that I do the walk back. Um, I wanted it to be the most obvious matchup and I couldn't figure out what that third spot would be because obviously Nissan and Supra, both automatics, both right around the 400 horsepower mark. Um, and then the, the next car I thought, you know, what I can do is I could, I can do a Corvette, a C8 Corvette and it'll destroy the other two cars. I mean, C8 is really quick. GM didn't want to give me one. They don't like me because I said it was good when the car came out. Not great, good, but it had a lot of potential. They didn't like that, so they there's didn't no get... fun in like absolutely annihilating the sort of main car anyway. And aren't, aren't those cars priced kind of differently? No, they're not that far off. So the, where the does Z, the Corvette start? Fifty something. So the, the Z was it's either forty one forty one thousand fifteen dollars base uh, or fifty one thousand fifteen dollars for the the performance, which gives limited slip, staggered, bigger tires. Um, and just a bunch of other little options. But the functional ones are the spoiler for the back, um, which is interesting, actually, because the base car has to be limited to two, don't, I may fuck this up, 230K kilometers, so 140 miles an hour-ish. Um, the performance car with the spoiler is limited to 155, 250K. Um, and that is not done for marketing reasons. The chief engineer was very clear about this. There is a rear-end lift situation with the with the car without the spoiler, and he was not comfortable limiting that car, allowing that car to go any faster than 220K, 220 or 230. I'll look it up. Um, and so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to say this to the audience on the on the video because I just think it's important for them to understand. If you buy the base car, don't flash it and get rid of your top speed limiter lest you wind up off the road. Like, you know. Do people in the U.S. really go that fast? They do for short bursts, and for short bursts, you can still catch a side wind. You can still try to turn, and when people are nervous, they tend to make bigger inputs, and that's kind of nerve. But I mean, think back to the original Audi TT; everyone was dying in that car in Germany. You know, they were—it was just a side wind or a turn situation. They had rear lift, and I don't know if this car is anywhere near that situation. You know, that it amazes level of lift. me that this is still a problem given the handle that people well, have on engineering modern cars. It's not really a problem it's a characteristic right so at, at any point they they can put a spoiler on it and make it perfectly fine which they did for the performance model and chose not to for the base that's another way of differentiating those two cars look there's ten thousand dollars difference between the base and performance and there's that's only the only car only comes in two specs that's it and i think part it's of not that like the 350z didn't that car come in like five different specs i didn't pay attention but probably or like porsche where you could get a million different op options I think what they did was figure out many ways that they could differentiate the two cars. And, you know, you have to for 10K. I don't think they're making any money at $41,000 on that car. I think they are breaking even or making a little bit of money at 50. And so they have to do things to to add. add to, make right? it so that you have to get the... Or make it so that it's worth it, right? right? But it is, so the spoiler maybe cost them X amount of dollars per car and they don't want to do it. But then the corollary of that was they did the right thing by limiting the speed of the car um, if they see that lift is, you know, is becoming a problem over 140 miles an hour. So props to Nissan for doing that. And then also for telling me about it, because, you know, a lot of companies would just say, oh, it's part of marketing. Um, and then people could get hurt. But the reality is that car mimics the roof line of the 240Z of the S30 cars so well that what are you going to do? Blame them? Say, well, you made it beautiful in a 1969 sort of way. And now it's going to have aerodynamics like a 1969 car. Of course it is. So yeah, that's a trade off I would make. The car's beautiful. Stunning. I haven't seen it IRL. IRL, so in photos, mm, the, really? the original photos of the car were taken very low, and it was the yellow paint. And so all you saw was the big blocky square air intake. Which is a reference to the first generation car, for sure. But most people, I don't think, realize that, because the first generation car was... Has a bumper bis that bisects that space and makes it not so... And I would, I would... Yeah. And I would say that's the least successful part of the new car's design, is that square opening huh. um, i like and, it but i think it's because i'm a sucker for the reference to the past we'll put a bumper bar in it 
Like that's my seat. But they chief engineer again, really fun guy. I mean, he was just one of these like, you know, like wacky, energetic Japanese guys who's so charismatic and fun. Um, he was jumping around and he was like, uh, we heard the feedback on the, um, uh, on the front end. Uh, thank you for feedback. <laughs> he was very much like, thank you. Shut the fuck up. I don't want to hear it anymore. Don't talk to me. But he said there was a hundred percent a functional decision that that engine needs a lot more cooling. 400 horsepower turbocharged, turbocharged right you have intercoolers you have a much bigger cooling package for a turbocharged engine um so it was born out of necessity and i will say in filming three days of abuse the likes of which i would like to not reveal <laughs> to reveal to the i mean we do terrible shit to cars when we're doing icons i went through four sets of tires four sets of rear tires um not well, once did you do that a lot of burnouts a lot of side won't do burnouts it cuts power stupidly but a lot of sideways shit and a lot of really low speed stuff so you know stop on the racetrack the the camera car continues on and then i light them up and do a, a, a standing rolling you know full throttle run spinning tire to 100 miles an hour and the second i pass that camera car from that from the, the camera which can't articulate around it's a flyby Every second that I'm past that car is wasted time. It's wasted gas. It's wasted time. It's the crews waiting for me to catch back. So I go from full throttle to ABS and they're moving at 50 miles an hour or whatever speed they're going. So what happens is you get repeated full throttle, zero to hundred to zero, to zero to hundred, to zero, to a hundred, to zero. And old cars, no way. I mean, they can't do this. Modern cars, a lot of them overheat. Brakes will overheat, engine overheats, oil gets really hot. Because as soon as you're done accelerating to 100, boom, stop. No, no cooling. Air, no air. Yeah. Uh, and then, Z, no problem. The Q50, when that, this, so this engine is the VR30 DDTT, which is <laughs> VR series V6. Isn't DDT illegal? DDTT. So it's two Ts, two Ds. Um, this is the engine that originally debuted in the GTR uh, as a VR38 DEDT. DE meaning uh, D something is D. I don't know what that stands for. An E is injection, but DD is direct fuel injection. So this now is a three liter version of the GTR's 3.8 with direct injection. Originally seen on the Q50 Red Sport 400, which was the 400 horsepower. Is twin this turbo. some kind of modern car? Q50, that's yes, an Infiniti. 2016, 2017, yeah. Okay. So that's their sports sedan. When we did an ignition episode on that at Motor Trend, uh, first of all, in testing, two of them blew up. Um, like blew a motor? Blew. Yeah. Wow. Uh, it, what was the failure mode? Uh, one was a rod. It was apparently a... a th I'm, this is hearsay. I heard this third, fifth party from whatever. One made a boom. The other one just went into this limp mode where it wouldn't go over 30 miles an hour or something. Um, and then they were like, mm, yeah, they took it away. So then but these are, in Nissan's defense, very early pre-production cars. They gave us another pre-pro car to do uh, an episode of Ignition on. And... It did ripped off one like 4.9 seconds, zero to 60. It was quick. And then from that point on, wouldn't go faster than 60 miles an hour. It overheated without a gauge ever moving. And as it turns out, they fixed this problem. But the root cause of all of the issues was um, they had to vacuum backfill the cooling system because the intercooler was getting a big bubble in it when they filled it at the factory. And again, this is not something to judge Nissan by because these were early pre-pro cars. Uh, but they figured that out thanks to our overheat issues. And I've, I've heard issues that these engines have had later on with overheating and limp modes and cooling down, uh, not being able to cool off. No issue in the Z. So that's pretty mm -hmm. impressive. So it has been developed. Mm -hmm. It developed to completion. It, does, it did nothing wrong. Yeah, so it's now like Porsche level. No. No, because it's, first of all, it's a V6. Mm. Don't love V6s. Sorry, in terms of durability. Yeah except that when you're driving like i had a supra was one of the other cars there and when you drive a supra or any bmw really you get a very or porsche you get a very clear indication that this thing was engineered to withstand anything they never overheat they never go into limp mode and they don't do anything to actively protect themselves from you this z does touch the brake pedal cuts power immediately no no joke and with all driver aids turned in off. all configurations yeah. really mm -hmm. so which means no brake you, you can't which i found out um what? what even when you're revving it from a start like or from like standing start in neutral 
you know, you you can watch the vacuum gauge. You're not even getting anything close to full throttle. So you can't get a whoom, 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 whoom. None of that. You get a whoom, whoom. And then it's got this really invasive limiter that'll let it to let it like moo its way up to 4,500, sometimes 5,000 for a second. And then right back down. If you hit the limiter in gear, it's seven grand and it starts to pull. You can see it pulling boost and, and throttle at like 65, 68. And then if you hit 7,000, it shuts it down till you hit 6,000 and then back up. Well, that must sound like a great rev limiter. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, if you're in the middle of a power slide, which I was 700 times, cuts power. And so it's not, wah, bah, 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 bah. it's just, Mah! and then the, it like mm -hmm. catches and then Mah! lights them back up again. There's a lot of stuff that feels like Nissan is protecting that engine and driveline from the, uh, you. from from the me mm -hmm. from the you like f full throttle shifts on the manual um no can't do the, the tranny doesn't like to be shifted all that quickly from first to second especially but the computer is watching clutch position and so you can slam shift the gears as hard as quickly as you want but until that clutch pedal is 100 percent at its resting place no power they're trying to save the clutch yeah but then they put no lift shift in it so, you know, you're like, on the one hand, you're like overly protective. And the other hand, and if you launch it in with like S mode, rev matching mode on, and you're at a stop, clutch in, first gear, full throttle, it'll hold it at whatever RPM you set, like 3,500. And then if you dump it from that point on, it will let you do no lift shifts. Uh, it saved two tenths of a second on the run to 60, which is only one shift. So that was a significant amount of time. Um, but if you so much as get to 99% throttle at any point during that run, it kills no lift shift. It doesn't tell you this. It's not like what? it's like, boom, canceled. Yeah. So In I had GT3, to, it, uh, as long as you're doing it, it does it. It does it. it. They don't care, right? So you can't feather the gas pedal off the line if you get too much wheel spin or wheel hop, which it does, which means... That's the shit. Yeah, it's they're, they're being protective, but then trying not to, but then having to. And protective then, of the car or protective probably, of the driver or the safety? The there's that too. If you if your brake lights are on when you make a transition from like one way drift to the other, and I often use left brake to to slow down that rotation, it turns on what one of the engineers thought was like ice mode because it fully runs the ABS pump at full speed and just it goes whatever direction it thought you wanted to go, even if that's where the camera car is, which made for a couple of Exciting moments. moments. Yeah. <laughs> um they're the car is just not developed to the same level that bmw develops their cars and it's nissan i know they just don't have the budget to do it but i'm really happy there's a z like i'm happy it exists and it's fucking fast and i mean this is an outside case that i think most consumers will not access presumably if you look at the people who drive 350z's and 370z's and g35's and whatever they will beat the shit out of these cars Correct, and maybe this is aimed at those people who have more shit-beating ability and less um, vehicle-controlling ability. Sure. They're probably trying to avoid them on medians coming out of cars and coffee and stuff like that. These cars are going to get wrecked a lot. And they're the perfect recipe. Short wheelbase, um, tires that either grip or you're on ice. And what kind of tires are they? They're Bridgestone SO7s. And in the video I made... I, <sighs> The way I phrased it on that walk back, as I, you know, I said, look, the Nissan lost time off the line. You know, I was pointing to Mustang and Supra. I'm like, Michelin, Michelin, Bridgestone. That came out a little bit wrong. And I kind of owe Bridgestone an apology for that. Bridgestone makes great tires. And I love, I, I think I've probably owned more Bridgestone tires than anything else. Mostly because Michelin won't make tires in the sizes that I need. But RE71Rs, like we race on them. Like they're great tires. Um, Nissan chose SO07s, which are grippy but then no grip when they let go so not the most progressive departure pro yeah what's the opposite of progressive instant shockingly fucking holy shit oversteer so the so there's there's a couple things that happen they you have a short wheelbase car you have a, a tire that grips and then lets go suddenly you have steering that is dead the fuck dead so this is an interesting one always or just on center Always, so almost all electric power steering setups now are pretty much dead on center. There's, you know, a little bit coming through. Um, and at the understeer limit, they're also dead. You should really feel an, an increase in effort with cornering load. And then as you hit the under understeer limit, you should feel that drop off. 
mm-hmm. with a hydraulic system or unassisted. which is very like natural and intuitive and communicates to you what the car is doing and how hard you're working it and all of the stuff that you want exactly and even the porsche came in gt4 rs communicates none of that at the limit i mean i just sat there on the drive and just doing this and i'm like where is the oh there's the limit right there but that's electric power steering what all of them do is wake up when you're sideways so there's so much of a self-corrective force especially on cars with a lot of caster and i don't understand i'm not a suspension engineer that when you're sideways this steering effort curve should actually go negative you're the, the car turns the other way the z does that but by the time it does that you are already spinning so when you get to that like 10 from zero to 10 degrees of rotation nothing comes through that wheel so when when by the time it starts moving you're just not going to catch it um early porsche epass 901.1 was this way and so what Por- the gt team did which was really smart was they realized that if they can't get the, the the geometry to overwhelm the assist motor what they can do is use the yaw sensors in the car to recognize when you're starting to come around and it just kicks your hands i've never noticed it i've never felt it but it's there according to them that you know you'll get the tiniest little kickback from the steering wheel that just wakes your brain up and says motherfucker you book correct Nissan needs to do this for this car because it doesn't, it's not intuitive. And to that point, one of the guys spun the car turning into the track, like on the public road. And this is a guy that I've worked with for seven years and has never had a moment in anything, looped it. And then the third, or I guess it's the fourth issue with the, the Z is that there's a secondary boost bump. So you get about 12 pounds of boost from as soon as it can build from 2000 RPM or whatever until about 4,000 and between four and five grand that 12 pounds suddenly ramps up to 15 and that's ferrari's you know everyone's managing boost to sort of give a little bit more of a visceral experience right so that is intended to add drama yeah and And presumably also in a situation where your tires are more hooked up and they can actually accommodate the boost true but it's more i think it's more than anything else to just encourage you to rev it you know because who wants to have a sports car that you're sitting at 2100 rpm when it goes um the problem is that secondary boost bump in second and sometimes third gear is enough to suddenly break the tires loose. So now you have a short wheelbase car with grip or ice tires, and they grip well and then don't, um, with sudden breakaway characteristics, no steering feel, and that secondary boost. And <laughs> you can see a lot of these, Yeah, you see a lot of these cars in Co Park. Right, and also they're uh, relatively affordable for how fast they are too. So you're yeah. going to attract perhaps less experienced more hooligan-y motorists yeah. it's just it's that it's a perfect recipe for a lot of these cars to go away and that's you know guess that, you better buy one and save it and keep it nice i mean there won't the, be any in 40 years which means, which means they'll be valuable and so the one those that do survive will be great i'm glad the cars i'm glad nissan's making that car i really am um 400 horsepower 400 turbocharged horsepower is really pushing what rear wheel drive can deal with I mean, the super is kind of similarly skittish <laughs> thing, that'll bite too mm-hmm. um whereas like the mustang with 480 horsepower naturally aspirated that we had there it's yeah because you got to be working the motor really hard in that window for it to be really it's the, the problem is the torque lump it, the it torque is, lump and the way it's delivered right yeah. it's either linear with a pedal on an na car or just you know a, a spike yeah this is the f80 m3 problem yep yep um but i'm i'm really looking forward to publishing that z icons because you know the drag race looked bad for the z like i you know in advance i had to get a bunch of cars together that i thought would it compete against well and it lost every race so i mean it tied the uh, the the mustang and and super tied each other through the quarter but the mustang was doing 120 instead of the supers 117 so it technically won um and then the nissan was three tenths i think behind which is not far and two two or three tenths is all it was and all of that was before 60 so once it you know past 60 miles an hour 60 through 110 it's dead even with the other cars um wasn't my intention to make it lose um and then uh the bonus round race was z versus an aston martin v8 vantage 4.7 um which was kind of a last second like wait a second the z is to the tenth of an inch the same exact size as the aston martin v8 vantage it's within 100 pounds of weight it's within 20 horsepower and four pound feet of torque like it's just identical on paper identical power to weight identical size um and for a while there, probably identical price i mean i think right now the astons are more like 60 oh you're talking about the four seven four sevens yeah four sevens are expensive yeah 
But, you know, with dealer markup, my thought, I didn't even say it in the video because I knew prices change over time. Um, but in the video, really, 60000 bucks will probably buy you a Z right now, $10,000 mark with a markup. $60,000 buys you a Mastin 4.7, same size, same same mm. horsepower. To buy. Mm-hmm. Same price to buy. To buy. Well, one of them will depreciate. The other one will appreciate and break. So, it will. It, the appreciation will mirror exactly the amount of money you spend on maintenance, if you're lucky. How many friends do we have that have V8 vantages and have not broken them? Had not broken them? Yeah, I guess that's a large number. They're really, they're really reliable. I hear stories, like kind of weird stuff, like I washed my car when it was sitting in the sun and the windshield broke. Mm. Stuff like that's that. That's a very British thing. Yeah. There's no sun there. They have never so been able to test a, that. It's something that they tested for. Look, Anthony, my director, blew, blew the motor in his 4.7 with 14,000 miles on it. I am just spun a rod bearing. Aston, the, to their credit, they were like, bring it over. Because he was brought it to an independent. And the guy's like, dude, I don't know what the fuck. And um, the corporate tore the engine down. And they're like, we don't know what happened. Like, it always had oil pressure. Everything was totally fine. And they replaced the engine for him. The 12-cylinder um, ones are the ones that are known for oiling problems. Well, that's why the, the dealer was like, wait a second. You have a, a, a V8, V8 that blew? Yeah. That blew up? The V12s, we expect this from. Hmm. But um i love that car i love that v12 i would deal with yeah oiling for sure absolutely Mm -hmm. and decades from now i think i mean with the t50 coming and the t33 coming this statement will lose veracity but uh the last v12 manual car ever yeah at a time yeah and naturally aspirated at that yeah I mean, the Gordon Murray cars will replace it, but I got, I've got i driven, what, 3,000? I have the spreadsheet. I don't have it out. Something press cars over the last, I'm, a, I'm about to hit 17 years in this business. The one car that I still dream about is the V12 Vantage S manual seven-speed. Mm. Love that car. A lot of people, well, it's exactly optimized for the things that you like. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a little bit unruly. It's mm-hmm. like... Um, the thing I thought about was like, it's like a Miata with a V12 in it. Like, it's like this I said sort that in of, the video. It's a 562 horsepower Miata. It's just really unruly, but in a way that is predictable. Because mm-hmm. unruliness without predictability is really sketchy. Let's see. Hmm. So you offered a number of dynamic criticisms about the car that especially apply at the limit. What is it like in other circumstances for a more normal use case? So there's a, there's a whole lot of internet like armchair worrying about this is the same fucking car, whatever. Here's the thing. It, it's not. So Nissan says 80% of the parts are new. Uh, I say bullshit. I say 80, of those 80% of parts that are new, they're just revised versions of the same part. So it is very much carryover yeah, and philosophy. Yeah, new part numbers. Right. I mean, it's so, but it, the old Z wasn't bad. It's double wishbone front suspension, which is something you don't see on cheap cars. Um, the big changes are all things that you really interact with so obviously styling right looks very different inside and out the interior is because nissan 10 years behind but that's a good thing when the rest of the industry is on this like usability decline with cluttering everything with touch sensitive fucking capacitive shit everything everything's got a real button and it works um so it's got an infotainment system it's got climate controls out of the old car and then like stability control is uh, like a mazda one press done no holding no rubber baby buggy bumper bullshit uh it just the car does what you want in terms of its interior and usability and so i I like that it's a bit stiff on the road it's not stiff it's choppy on the Mm. road um firm which is ironic because it's strongly damped well the weird thing is it's loose on the track so it's got a lot of body roll and a lot of brake dive and a lot of excel squat um so what i think it is I think Randy Pope's confused the shit out of me because Randy was like, wait a second, it's got too strong of springs and not and not enough damping. And I'm like, wait, I thought it was the other way around because it's moving around so much. Um, yeah, that would it, be soft springs. That's what I, I think it's soft springs and um, it's stiff that dampers. allow movement. It's all fine. It's well controlled. Um, but to drive it other than the dead steering, it's quite nice. It's a nice car to, to live with. Stereo sucked. I don't know what the, I don't know if it was XM because I didn't like pair a phone and it just sounded like garbage and it was Bose. Hmm. Um, but it, that just could be XM receiver that's within the thing. 
Otherwise, nice seats, great driving position. Now the, te- the steering wheel now telescopes, which it didn't do before. Um, and so the things you interact with, which are steering, which is E-Pass versus the old cars, hydraulic, totally new. Uh, and the engine, totally new. Like not, It's not a VQ30, it's a VR. It's a completely different series of engines. Um, and that, har- like everyone loves VQs, so I'm going to get crucified for this. But outside VQs, they sound amazing. You know, we all know that FX50 or F- FX35 exhaust from 15 years ago. Oh, that's wonderful. Inside the car, ooh, hmm. they sound like shit. Um, this is solved. I mean, it's still a harsh V6, but it's way better. So everything you interact with is very different than the old car. And overall, it's nice. It's a nice $40,000, $50,000 sports car. It's just not a car for the committed driving enthusiast who wants to drive it at the limit a lot. It it is. You just got to learn. It's not. It's not that it's bad. Like it doesn't overheat. It doesn't. It doesn't try to kill you. You just have to know what you're up against. And I really think a set of more progressive tires would help. Even different Bridgestones, like you know, R seventy ones are way more progressive to me at, at the limit. Um, Unless you're in the wet, in which case you've already pirouetted, yeah. pirouetted off into the scenery. Pirouetted, yeah. pirouetted, pirouette, pirouette. Um, yeah, I, no, I think it's a nice car. My, listen, at the end of the day, I was thinking about this. I don't think I've ever loved a sedan-based sports car. It's thirty-six hundred pounds. I mean, every sedan-based sports car, Z3s, all of the BMW Z4s, they just always lose comparison tests to purpose-built sports cars and right now we have shocking yeah and in the sort of normal person price range we have brz and miata and that's it and brz is a fucking hundred times more fun than the z right because it's 800 pounds lighter and it's a revy and snappy and there's none of the isolation that you get in a car that originally existed to be a luxury sedan so i mean but the z was always sedan based the original one was basically a 510 with different rear suspension. So. But dynamically quite entertaining. Mm-hmm. As is this car. It's fun. It's fun. I mean, it's fun to be able to rip through gears on a 400 horsepower car sideways. You know, I had a lot of fun filming. Okay. Um, we also did at the same time. But you're very sort of couched about your comments about the car dynamically. It's, <laughs> first of all, the Supra is a high bar, right? Because it's BMW's best engineering plus Toyota's feedback that made them make a better car so super is quite good um this was an automatic super they're making a manual one now yeah that they just announced they haven't they're not out yet or i would have done that um but yeah they have not yet um no one's that i know of has driven the the manual um but the super is a high bar and it's look it's i just have a hard time imagining spending fifty thousand dollars maybe i'm just cheap but fifty thousand really on a two seat two seater i mean uh, an on a new one yeah yeah. On an I mean, old one, I would do it. I actually, so <laughs> I actually, I'm on a kind of a search for an old one. For a Z? Yeah, I just don't know what I'd have to sell to get it, because I definitely have to sell something. Um, uh, so this must be the result of you having interacted with one at length for the Icons episode? So I finally drove a stock 240Z for Icons. We brought it out. This wonderful guy that I'd met at Cars and Coffee. Um, I think you were there. You probably know him. Yes, the yellow one. Yes, that car is so beautiful. And we were trying to film up here in Northern California. Didn't work. So we had to move it down to SoCal. And I reached out to him and said, hey, I just want you to know I'm looking for a car similar to yours in Southern California. And I want you to hear it from me first. Not thinking that I'm cutting you out of this, but we're doing it in SoCal now. And he was like, I'll be there. And he drove it down. Wow. Mm-hmm. It was awesome. Um, and so that was my first time interacting with an original car. I've never driven a stock one, actually, because mine had a 2.8 in it when I bought it. Have I told this story on Carmudgeon before? I think so. But about you how it, yeah. it smoked so badly that we had to drive it in the middle of the night with the windows closed. Anyway. It, I, I, it had a three liter when I finished with it. It was a two eight when I bought it. Neither of which is original. Triple carburetors. Originally, they would be two mm-hmm. Stromberg, I think, mm-hmm. which are like SU emissions friendly SU uh, copies and two point four liters. So this one was this one had Weber's on it, um, but it was otherwise stock. And two, I, two Weber's, mm. two Weber's. You know, I think it might have been triple. Mm. Damn, I'm not gonna have to look at the pictures. I didn't have time to. This is the problem. Is it was like yeah, with filming is just crazy. Cars. Yeah, 
but uh, the car's mostly stock or stockish. And I, when I read all the road tests on the car, they were bitching about how it just didn't make any power up top. And all of the Zs that I've driven have been spicy. So I got on this thing and I was like, oh, oh, hold on. This is what they meant because it makes the most glorious noise and all kinds of power, but it's over at five grand, 52, 55, somewhere in there. Um, whereas the other Z that I spent the most time in is a Rebello built three one. Mm-hmm. That is the probably best sounding, most interactive six cylinder I've ever driven. Right. And that's an L series motor. Mm-hmm. That's the single overhead cam one that you, I think you told me is a copy of a Mercedes yep. 230 SL. Sort of vaguely a derivative of it. Yeah, man. That but thing that's is a single cam. Motor. Single that's cam like motor. a, and it's like, isn't, is it even a cross flow head? I don't know. I don't think it's a cross flow head. It's amazing. It made, it's so fucking fast, that car. Yeah, mine was a Rebello 3 liter. I cheaped out and got a 3 liter. Because you put a diesel crank and then you get 3 1. Mm. And I did a. a uh, diesel what crank? I don't know. They have some six cylinder diesel engine and you put the crank in that and that gives mm. you a little more stroke. Mm. Uh, and that's how you get to 3 1 from 2 weight. But mine was a 3 liter and it was a cast iron motor. It wasn't a forged motor. And even so, it, I mean, it probably had like 270 horsepower with triple carburetors and the car weighs like, you know, 14 ounces. <laughs> it was way overpowered for for the rest of the car. I, f- I feel a little bit bad bringing it up even, but there was an incident where uh, Matt Farrow from the Smoking Tire drove a Ferrari 250 GTO that was actually a replica and he didn't know it. And the guy, it was, uh, but underneath it was a 240Z with like a hot motor in it. And he apparently, I've never seen the video, it's down, but he, it fooled him into thinking he was driving a Ferrari because of the noise. No. Um, yeah. And they, to but me, they sound. they're so, sound, so, the I, cars are so different. You know that. If you've never experienced a 250 or any of those early Ferraris, you wouldn't know. And so, I, you know, a lot of people laughed at Matt, but I'm like, uh, hey, how many of you guys would really know the difference? I mean, one's rack opinion, the other's steering box. I mean, the shifter feels totally different. There are differences, but I've experienced The shift pattern is different. That's also true. Um, so this is the, so I made one I'm, line in there that, you know, in the icons that, uh, in the revelations actually that I did in the car, which is also coming up, um, that this, the, the sound of this engine has fooled more than one journalist in thinking this is a V12, because it really is a magnificent sounding engine. I mean, that's like a substantial portion of why I bought the car. I bought the car because I wanted to listen to glorious inline six noises. And nice. I remember as a, like in, in high school, one drove by me going the other direction. And I was like, that's it. Like it's, I, I mean, I've, I would have loved to have had an E-type, but I was like, I can't afford an E-type. Does, it, does the E-type sound better than like a, a hot motored Z? Not stock. Mm. If they're both spicy, they're both really great. I mean, the E-type has this problem I don't know if we should do an episode at some point about tax horsepower. Mm-hmm. How's that for an exciting episode about, let me tell you about tax horsepower and this, Yeesh. this, okay. There, tax horsepower is this thing that used to be used to calculate like road taxes um, for cars like in the 20s and 30s. This is in very, your very D. Tim Scott. Uh, no, I learned this recently. It was very fascinating to me because uh, the reason why all of these old British cars have such tractory motors is because it's a result of the regulations. The regulations basically specified that you would pay a tax, road tax, on the basis of most countries would do total displacement and cylinder count. Right. In Great Britain, they would do it on the base of bore only and cylinder count. Stroke was not part of the equation. Mm. So in order to get power, the motors would get really long strokes because that would have no tax implication for the people registering the cars. The result is they created a bunch of long stroke motors which have high, high piston speeds, which means they don't rev. Because right. if you rev a, you know, a long stroke motor to 5,000 RPM, that's the equivalent piston speed of, I don't know, seven or eight, seven or eight yeah. in a more conventional dimension motor. So the Jag XK engine suffers from, from a long, excessively long stroke hmm. for the displacement. Uh, and so they don't, you know, in racing form, they can fix all that and put titanium connecting rods in when they build modern race motors and all that stuff, and you get rid of that issue. But if you drive a stock like E-Type or any other like British car, and this is the problem with Triumphs, and that's also why they have such sort of like antediluvian head designs in the Austin six cylinders and MGB motors, because mm. they're never flowing enough gases for that, for head design to really matter because they're such long stroke. Well, and small RPM bore, motors. small bore means small valves. Yes. Two. That's exactly. the other. So they're just like, I don't know, let's put side valve. Like, interesting. That's so, so interesting. So E-type motors, they're really torquey um, because they're long stroke. 
Uh, and if you do like a race build, they get sort of spicy and responsive and exciting, but they're intrinsic sort of natural. And that works fine also because they were used originally for sedans mm -hmm. because the XK engine originally was intended for use in a new Jaguar sedan, but the, the car wasn't ready in time. So they're like, well, the engine's ready. We should put it in something to showcase it. And so they were like, let's just sort of slap together a little sports car to put to showcase the motor since this car that it's intended for is not ready yet. And that became the XK120. Mm -hmm in 1948 but that motor was always intended as a sedan motor uh, but they used it in in both cars so the only e-type i've ever driven was the continuation lightweight yes and, and that motor God. is not like a sort of sleepy torquey low revy motor that's that like the one you want top they, 10 motors i've ever experienced yeah it's up there with like gullwing 300 sl going straight six i think it's a more exciting motor than the, the 300 sl motor yeah. um unbelievable but either way the, the fact that we're talking about a Datsun in this yes. in this here's another one so the revelations which will be out in a couple of days from now which means before this episode goes live it will have come out last Thursday yes exactly is on a, if you're a, watching this on Monday but what if they're watching it on Tuesday it will still have been last Thursday what about Thursday if they're watching it on Thursday it will have also been last Thursday okay, just, just but if they're watching it Friday then it would have been the Thursday before last stop it <laughs> my brain is going to explode it's going to be brain matter all over the place palo's over there going like i can't keep up with this guy he's too smart um so that's I not the reason why he can't keep up <laughs> it has nothing to do with intelligence his coffee shop was closed this morning that was the problem he walked in oh i cannot do this you have an italian accent he's actually from california um the uh palo just needs to be this off-camera character who we just fuck with the whole time it's like uh peanuts when all the adults don't have heads and they like just are existing yeah. only as sort of nominally as characters. Sorry, Pilo, your head has been lopped off. His care. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so the revelations I did on Z, I thought, okay, I can go. Which I was, came out last Thursday. Which came out last Thursday, <laughs> which had done come out on the previous Thursday. I was going to use that yellow car, and then I remembered a friend of mine has. I just remembered. Well, I don't remember, but I, then I sort of occurred to me that a friend of mine has a Z, Fair Lady Z432, uh, which is a 240Z. It is the 240Z. I think so, too. Um, so Japan market only. Uh, the S20 engine, which is from the original uh, Skyline GTR. Is that a Nissan motor or a Prince motor? It was originally a Prince motor in the R380 race car. Uh, it was it was called something else it was like a g something if i can't remember but it was you know but nissan absorbed prince in 1966 i think it was that sounds right to me and then they had this motor and they're like what do we do with it and their plan was to throw it in the so they made the skyline gtr because the motor was sitting around and they there's at least some lore that part of the reason why they decided to go back and do the z because they abandoned the plans halfway through development basically um is because they had this motor and they're like fucking do it so they threw for, for the whole car for the whole car yeah they were going to abandon the 240z they, they the fair so, lady well remember that fair lady started out as what we call the Datsun roadster so the first fair lady was a, a two-seat british type sports car uh, which meant two-seat open top roadster uh the you'll learn you will have learned this in the uh, revelations episode but the the industry was convinced that the u.s f like looming u.s rollover regulations were going to kill convertibles and so hence the existence of the porsche targa i put that in the script i'm so glad you said that because that's what i did i'm like that's why i don't think people realize why targa is a target yeah and there was no convertible 911 for the first 20 years of yeah. its life yeah I, I mean the 107 no one thought was going to happen because the, i don't well, think 107 meaning the 1972 one one seventy one to nineteen eighty nine. Uh Mercedes SL. Yeah. Um that was not, you know, there was a lot of doubt on whether that was going to be able to be sold in America because we had these rollover regulations that were looming. Um so Nissan at so the, it's so funny in, in doing research for that show, I always keep finding spots where people have used the phrasing at the suggestion of the government in Japan or at the suggestion of the financing bank. So basically, it looks like there's a lot of strong arming that has happened throughout history. Um, so basically, the bank that financed Nissan told them, you're buying Prince. That's how that happened. Or I'm sorry, the government did that. But the bank that was financing Nissan also had Yamaha as a client. And they said, to, you two are going to work together on a sports car. So to replace the Fair Lady, which was that Roadster... Which had sort of just happened with the Toyota 2000 GT with Toyota, right? No, 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 not yet. So this is 63, 62, oh, 63, 64, 65. The um, 
they started on this project where Yamaha developed a coupe, um, a two-seat coupe, with the help of a guy named Albrecht Goertz. Yes. Um, yeah. This is a German who wants to take credit for everything. Um, uh, including the BMW 507. 507. He was on the 911 team. Um, and so Nissan brought him in as a consultant. And his advice was make a car the size of a, uh, a 911 that can fit two Americans. That was his thing. Then you can sell it in the U.S. market. Um, so Yamaha built this car called the, the A550X, which they took a experimental U.S., like a U.S. aviation engine that was an experimental that was made out of sheet steel, if I remember correctly. I just did this research like a month ago. You'd think I'd remember this. Sheet but steel? Sheet steel. Including the pistons? Well, it didn't work. And that was the problem. But they took the base engineering layout of it and made a cast iron, I think it was cast iron, but a traditional cast engine out of it. It was a twin cam four-cylinder. Um, and they put it in this A550X and presented it to Nissan. Like, hey, here's a new fair, fair lady, if you like it. And Nissan was like, we don't like it. It's uh, the, the feedback was that it was like, unrefined and there this was, was sup- intended to supplant replace the fair lady fair lady ro- roadster mm-hmm. which did eventually get a two liter twin got a two liter cam. twin cam yeah uh which was ba- based on i believe the 1600 whatever it was whatever that lineage was i think it was just an extension of that it was not the yamaha engine because the engine apparently was coarse no one liked it at nissan um and so the whole project died they they just let the whole thing go away like yeah we did what the bank told us to do fuck you yamaha go fuck yourself yamaha took that over to the CEO of Toyota and let them drive and say, hey, do you want to do a sports car? And Toyota drove the A550X and apparently said all of the same things. It's really interesting. The two books that I have, the feedback from both companies was the same. It was crude. It was this, whatever. But there's one book is about the 2000 GT and the other book's about the 240Z, right? Right. And yeah, the A550X exists in both of those worlds, yes. which is really fun. So the revelation inside insider story, the revelations after the Z, which will be a while because it's we have a backlog and edit, is the 2000 GT, which I already shot. But you can't do one without the other because the two cars. So what happened was, which is so funny because you think of them in completely different leagues now from a collectability standpoint. Well, because one of them sold 420 units and the other sold 500,000. Yes, for some exactly. ridiculous number. And um, but so the interesting so A550X was terrible apparently. Toyota said, no, thanks. But they were so impressed with the fact that Yamaha had pulled this whole thing off that they said, you know what? Why don't we, they sent over, I think it was five or six guys full-time installed at Yamaha and said, let's make a sports car together. That would be well, raceable. That's actually good. That's, yeah, raceable on the world stage. And they have all these requirements. Um, and from that, the 2000 GT was born. Nissan had no plans to do anything. The public sees the 2000 GT in, I think, 65 Tokyo Auto Show. And then right away, a convertible version of it, ironically, because remember, there, it was a coupe because of the U.S. regulations that would prohibit convertibles. But they chopped the roof off for the James Bond movie, You Only Live Twice. Which came out in 1967. 67. The whole world lost its mind over this car. And so Nissan says, oh, fuck it. Let's start this Fair Lady project back up again. So they went back to their drawings and they started back up and developed the 240Z um which was also to be sold in america as a fair lady but mr k who is the sort of nissan hero of america said no we can't call it a fair lady it's a butch sports car it can't be you know a feminine i don't remember exactly what his quotes were um, but like it it can't be soft it needs to be butch so they just chose the word the letter z Um, so they added fair lady z for the rest of the world or for japan and we got the 240z and that's the birth of the story so 240 and 2000 gt are so closely related um, especially when you get a Z432, because the Z432 is... Yes, because the motor configurations are very similar, because they're both two-liter twin-cam dual overhead. Or they're, yeah. One is four-valve, the other is two-valves, right? right? The Toyota one is two-valve. The Yamaha's two-valve. I think it's two-valve. They're both twin-cam. They're both dual overhead yeah. cam inline sixes of two liters, but one is a four-valve, I think, in the other. The, the S20 is definitely four-valve. Um, yes, that is because a, that's what the four and 432 stands for. Yeah, four valves per cylinder which in 1960 something come on that's nuts mm-hmm. four cam uh, four valves per cylinder three carburetors two camshafts mm-hmm. um and so when you get those two cars together it's really wild because they look so similar they're born of the same idea they right the same concept by you know with the same through thread from Gertz, who i make fun and of yamaha about, and yamaha yamaha built that car and their piano division did the wood mm-hmm. oh god that interior and I, the handbrake to me is just so comedic comedic 
Yes. Why is art funny? It's art. Because it's just such an unconventional action. It pulls straight out. Yeah, but like, why is it there? It's such a, it's like on display. It's in a prominent location, which is not something that people usually do. They don't showcase the handbrake. It rides but if on, it looks like that. It rides on ball bearings. It's the yeah. smoothest yeah. action. It move. feels so expensive. That for, whole car. Oh my God. The first time I drove one of those things, I, I, well, I noted that like, this is the Rolls Royce of the bunch because I'd driven it with the Z432 and the Hako and all the, like the most amazing original Japanese cars, uh, sports cars. And they, um, I just said, this is like the Rolls Royce of the bunch. And even the hood release, which you pulled on the other cars and you had a, boom, 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 you know, this room was silent on that mm-hmm. car. You pulled it and went. I mean, that's why they sold 420 of them because they were so damn expensive. Fortune. Yeah. Yeah. But by the way, the Z432 was twice the price of a two, like a 200Z or 240Z in Japan. Yeah, so they so were all really of that expensive. money went into the motor. The motor, yeah. But uh, Which is, I will say, the best sounding six-cylinder motor engine ever made. Which? The S20? S20. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just positively epic. I've not driven it in a Z. I've driven it in a Hako. So I've driven in a Hako, and the one that, the one, it's the same collector, his, uh, Stage name is Winthrop P. Rutherford, that we came up with years ago. Uh, <laughs> for what kind of performances? Uh, for what? Oh, for the performance of loaning me cars. I mean, he just you know, he's kind of a private guy, and he just doesn't want his name out there, and I don't blame him. Um, but his Hako I use for the Motor Trend video, and that thing is dead until 5,000, and mm-hmm. then wakes up, and I think my quote in the magazine at the time was, all cocaine and wasabi over five grand, from five grand to 7,500. It's just nuts. He had the Z432 tuned, um, by a pro once again to run pr- properly on these Webers that he has on it. And oh my God, pulls. I mean, it's it's in, truly insane from five to seven grand, but from idle to 4,500 to 5,000, it's waking up beautifully. Man, is that engine magic. Mm-hmm. Magic. 160 horsepower out of two liters. Yeah, that's a lot of specific something. output. Mm-hmm. A lot on of carburetors rest. and like ancient, like point-based ignition. Yeah. Epic. Just insane. Yeah. And in a streetcar, no less. Mm-hmm. Um, you drove the 2000 GT? Did you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, impressions? It is a one, it is a quiet, smooth, comfortable, sounds great, does everything really well GT. Not, it's a, you would think it's an amazing experience until you drive the Z432 because the engine is just night and day different. So the, the Toyota's gears are really long. Um, and it, so it winds up being comfortable. It's great. It, it's great but the nissan's steering was truly unbelievable um absolutely no play i mean it was just i'd say nissan made the better car not i mean better sports car better sports car. craptastic interior versus like genuine near rolls royce levels of wood and chrome and beauteous but um i can see why one's a million dollar car and one's a fifty thousand dollar car um well four three twos aren't 50 fair enough fair they're enough. like three or four hundred i don't know yeah i don't even know what it's worth don't tell me I don't don't break that my dream because I would I would own one of those cars. Yeah, the 2000 GT to me I think though is just probably the coolest Japanese car. I desperately want one of those. It's so beautiful. It is probably the Japanese car I most want to own. Not a Honda Beat. Not a Honda Beat. You just drove it. That I did we drive your oh, Honda Beat. Were we, we supposed to? We were supposed to talk about that. All right, we have like five minutes. So you drove the Beat on the way here. Mm-hmm. You giggled like a schoolgirl being tickled. Yeah, that's weird. Creepy, it is weird. Creepy. Or is the car? Are you talking about the car or my comment? I mean, it tickled me. I, I wow. I wish I had it on video. You giggling? Stupid, isn't it? Yeah, I totally see the appeal. It is not the best highway car, but it's better than I thought it was going to be. Better it's actually Miata. usable on the highway. Better. Other than the engine sitting at seven thousand RPM. Yes. Better wind control. Yes. Better ride. Yeah. No, no, no. I, it's just the thing about it. It needs a sixth gear. And a seventh. Possibly eighth as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. looking down and seeing the thing turning at 7,000 RPM when you're going, whatever it is, 75 miles an hour, was a little bit, like, alarming. Mm-hmm. Although under six, it doesn't really make all that much. It yeah, doesn't at, sound stressed until no, seven. No, I agree with that. At 4,000 RPM, it, fe- it feels like 2,000 in a regular car. Well, because it's basically half a 911 motor. So at 4,000 in, in that engine is 2,000 <laughs> Moving the RPM. same number, yeah. amount of gases as no not even close because it's 660 cc that would be a 1.3 liter straight six uh flat six but um no but it's moving the same amount of combustion cycles so it really 4000 isn't insane yeah it's pretty uh easy to use at that speed 
Uh, it would be a wonderful city car. It would be a great alternative to a golf cart. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, it has like, it's like f- very clearly a sports car just scaled down mm-hmm. in a way that's really enjoyable, actually. Oh, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, we also promised another thing, which was... You a, promised this. Did I? Is this my fault? Mm-hmm. Um, right, so there, there, remember, there's Beatrice, which is my... Bron- originally was bronze it, but then faded to a lovely shade of nothing. Shit box E30. And then there's the rose gold E30, which was is the cashmere car that looks completely different, even though it's also Jewish racing gold. Um, <laughs> and that, yes. But that has paint on it and is stunningly beautiful. So Beatrice is the ugly, like, puts out sister. And, <laughs> and rose, rose gold is the uh, pretty one, too. Isn't quite as quick. So... On the last episode, we talked about how that car felt super slow, and then I put normal engine mounts in it, got rid of the poly mounts, and all of a sudden it felt quick and went from being broken to just not broken. Like, it feels fine. Um, And so we promised... A drag race for science. Yep. And so what we did was we fucked up, and we didn't scientifically do this, because B... Beatrice has the wrong size tires on it. It's got 50 series instead of 55. So it's got it gives a an gearing. appreciable gearing advantage. Yeah. And you can see that in the results of the drag race, which was a very legal thing for us to do. Yes. Yeah. That, those cops stopping traffic on both sides of the roads were so helpful. Traffic being us. Um, Go. But yeah, so the result is Beatrice is quicker. Um, but interestingly enough, Beatrice couldn't. So it, through first gear, they were about even. If anything, Rose actually might have been a little bit quicker. Um, but I got a little jump on you. And then in second gear, you just walked away. Um, and then we did it again as a second gear roll, just from, you know, from idle, 1, basically. 1,500. Go. um and oh it was 1500 for me that's the thing is in the video which i guess we should play as soon as i'm done with the sentence you can see the gearing advantage they both have the same diff so this is nothing more than the gearing advantage from the the tires tires um you hit you shifted i mean i started at 1500 rpm when we were leaving i don't know where you started but either i was i started next to you i was video trying to video legally video you um and then but you shifted and i'm like i'm at five grand and you could very clearly hear the gearing difference so b is quicker but i kind of wonder if b feels stronger down low more torque yeah, more torque down low which makes me think that the one of the things that i haven't been able to check you can't check really on an e30 is is ignition timing and injector timing because they're done off of a hall sensor on the crank pulley which is not adjustable on the later cars but is adjustable on the earlier cars so if somebody put a different crank pulley on it it could be off slightly and that could be changing timing so the car could just be not getting full timing and that's kind of what it feels like it's just never quite as quick the moral of the story though is that the car fundamentally is not broken yeah which was a concern when it had the old motor mounts right it's amazing how bad motor mounts unless your theory about the knock sensors getting triggered by doesn't have vibration oh it doesn't no so my theory was that the air fuel meter was Uh was vibrating um, but a lot of people actually in the comments and a lot of people DM me like, hey, knock sensors will trip. doesn't have them. So mm. too old for that. Um, but it's amazing that how it completely fooled. I mean, you've driven, you drove the car before and after. And I, I think you just said something this morning. You were like completely different car transformed. Yeah. Like, is it on? Yeah. I think you did say that. Um, well, we conducted science. We conducted science. For the purpose of science, we conduct, conducted science. Um, so we'll see we'll see i will still as long as i have it i will continue to trace the problem and make it make full power so next step will be dynoing it at some point or if i just sell it because i just don't have time for this yeah something else you needed to buy oh you need to buy it as e well oh I'm, no the, sp- the spot that has been occupied by selling beatrice hypothet sorry by selling rose gold hypothetically has already been filled by the purchase of by the, the beat. beat right so you'd have to sell something i'd else. have to sell something else and then there's the minivan. I, we, we used a minivan for a 
for as a production van, like rented it from Enterprise, and it was so helpful to have on this shoot that I think I'm gonna have to buy a minivan for work. Can't Haggerty buy that? <sighs> Maybe it'll be the only mini. Do you think Haggerty insures with any customers uh, minivans? No, no. So unless somebody's like got like a wood sided original wood sided eighty four turbo, yeah. turbo um, manual. Yeah. Okay. Caravan. So I it could they, be done. I, you know what? I can ask the insurance people. I if bet there we are if the number the the demographic information mm-hmm. for minivans insured with Haggerty. That'd be awesome. We what is the two? world's most collectible minivan? It's got to be the. Woody. Wasn't there like an SRT or like a a, a hot version? There's the man van, I think they called it, right? There was there was I don't know. Yeah, this is was, well outside of my area of expertise. One of the Chrysler minivans you could get with like an appearance package, package and like you Michigan Michiganese. There was like a turbocharged manual one, I think. Oh, that's the early one. Yeah, the early one had you can get a turbo manual, and they did incredible burnouts as I've seen on YouTube, huh. um, and things that were prior to YouTube. Um, I've never driven one. It's like an Omni Shelby, but in yeah, minivan. Put in form. minivan form. Yeah, mm. I love minivans. Really? They have the flip and fuck seats. They Chrysler calls them stow and go, but really they're flip and fuck. I mean, they just the whole the thing turned into like I rent it from Enterprise. I go home and it's a cargo van, and we unload all the gear and then put the whole crew in it because the seats unflip and fuck, and then it seats seven people. I, I got twenty four miles per gallon at like super legal highway speeds. Like, come on. Okay, I'm talking i'm not in at risk of buying one but maybe you will i think i can get him to do it okay <laughs> exciting news exciting news from next the week studio. <laughs> next week derek's like welcome to the 54th episode where i just bought six minivans <laughs> god if you buy a minivan i'll rent it from you uh i would rent it to you at the same rate that it cost to buy and that's it would break much. even very quickly very quickly <laughs> that's good a good business opportunity perfect all right okay um, until next week until episode 54 we're gonna the this, minivan episode we're gonna do this again studio episode 54 should be a disco episode studio 54, studio 54 yes 57 will be ketchup i just imagine a ketchup fight heinz 57 varieties yeah i don't know yeah, i was okay. just imagining yeah. what a ketchup okay. episode would look like <laughs> ketchup okay. episode we have to end this episode before we can get too far off the deep end. Um, Farther off the deep end. Okay, then we're supposed to say things again like... Uh, Haggerty name, Podcast Network. I can't say that. You can say that. I just did. I okay, can say, good. my name is Jason Kamisa, and this is Derek Tam-Scott. And you've just completed an hour or so of the Carmudgeon Show, which is part of the... Haggerty Podcast Network. And sponsored, sponsored by... by Pennzoil. Yes. All right. Guys, I need oil. 1550, 2050... 2050 for a couple of them and then 1550 or 1050 for the whatever. Buy good luck. Buy lots of oil. We're done, right? Yes. Oh. But still, now <laughs> still done. <laughs> Bye. Oh god. <clears throat>